In terms of um, some equipment that I've had a lot of fun using in the studio, uh, on the Perfume Genius record, No Shape, the engineers, Sean Everett and Joseph Lorge and myself, we were into using the Neumann KU100 head microphone for doing um, a lot of binaural uh, recording. There was one instance where uh, on the first track of the record, uh, which is called Other Side, we were trying to sort of create this picture of a, a, a room with like a like road seating or church pews, and um, that there was like a preacher at the front of the room with a microphone and like a little PA system and kind of giving a sermon or, or leading a third of the room in like a hymn or something like that. So what we did was we we set up the head mic. Uh, at a stationary point in the room. And then we had um, four or five people go to different spots in the room and, and, um, and layer their, their background vocals. And then Mike, the, uh, the lead singer, was in one spot of the room with a PA. So you have this sort of, um, this, this perspective that all comes from the head microphone. And then uh, on other songs, we, we had Mike um, sing lead vocals into the head so that the listener has this feeling that like they're getting a lap dance sort of, like it's like going in from like one ear and kind of whispering and then into another and just had fun with it, you know? Tried to get a little perverse. It's such an easy piece of equipment to use because you set it up and it really does do a great job of recreating the feeling of, of, of listening with your own ears and, and that sort of psychoacoustical space. If what is at the source sonically, um, the instrument or the voice or whatever, if, if that sounds good, the, the, the KU100 does a good job of, of not getting in the way of that. It does a great job at capturing a physical space, the sound of a room. So if you have an environment that has a lot of reverb, like an echo chamber, using the the Neumann head in that space makes somebody feel like they're actually in there with you. It's a little different than simply sending audio into a chamber using microphones to then record the sound of the chamber. That's the, the, the typical process. But to put a musician into an echo chamber and then have the Neumann head in there is a little different. It's like something everybody should do before they die, find an echo chamber somewhere and just go sit in it with a guitar or whatever. One thing that I've noticed um, that we do in records that we're working on is a sort of blend between mixing and overdubbing. Like they'll happen concurrently, simultaneously, and it was always a natural thing for me because I felt like in mixing, you start to realize how much space you have or don't have in, in a track. And so to try to fill in a void um, and design a sound to specifically suit a certain purpose that uh, reveals itself during the mixing process um, just seemed obvious to me. And as, as other um, record makers would witness that they would say, "Oh, that's so strange. You know that 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 can be so problematic. You know, because you just keep chasing your own tail sometimes, and and that can certainly happen. But it's a thing that I didn't realize was unique until people started saying it was unique. I would imagine that that every everybody can kind of relate to that. Like the you know the most unique things about them are probably the things that feel most deep rooted in their identity that don't feel unique. You're not, you're not trying to be different, you know, by doing those things. It just makes sense to you for whatever reason. There's a fella named Austin Hooks who I met some years back. And he had been, he had gotten really deep into the conversion of old film projectors into guitar amplifiers using the, the audio section of these Bell and Howell film projectors as um, basically an amp head. 
he wasn't the only person doing it, but he had a real specific sense of what to change and what not to change about them. And uh, we were introduced by a mutual friend, and I started to get really into the sound of, of these projector amps he was making, and, and we would kind of come up with ideas of like tone sculpture, sort of, and like, you know, how to, how to nudge it in a little more in this direction, or you know, what would it sound like if you rebuilt this section, and just that sort of back and forth beta testing process. And um, over the course of that, really ended up finding somebody who, who became um, uh, a really important ally of mine, not only in terms of the, the projectors, but just having somebody who understood how guitar amplifiers work so that if there was something I was craving or missing or wanting an amp to do, or, or, or even more importantly, something that a particular amp that I had, that it was doing that it wasn't designed to do, like it was mal malfunctioning in some way, but that I didn't want to have that change. To have somebody who understands the mechanics of something, but is not so academic as to fix everything in it, you know, to understand the, the importance of idiosyncrasy and things not working as they should. That's something that I feel like um, carries over into everything, right? Like that, that sentiment is a, is a thing that I try to um, keep in mind and listening to music and making it and, and thinking about gear and coming from um, the, the producerial role um, in, in record making and how that's often viewed as like the, a, a counterpart to the artist. I've had a lot of conversations um, in the last few years with artists who who struggle to define the the role that they want the producer to have in their record because that they, they don't want it to just merely decide what the record will sound like. You know, that oftentimes artists at this point in the game like they have a strong opinion of what they want the record to sound like and even who they want to have play on the record and where they want to record it. Like there are a lot of decisions that an artist will have made today before the record's even written that typically I, I think fall under that list of what people commonly assume a producer does. And the reality of it is that there are examples of records where the things that you assume were the producer's touch are not, that they come entirely from the artist. And I guess maybe if there's some insight into that, it would be that um, just as as an artist shouldn't be made to feel like they have to define themselves and, and what they do and what their sound is, I don't know that a producer has to fit a certain definition or description. I, I think, if anything, what's enabled me to um, work with so many different people is that I... I, I don't have a definition for what that role is other than to just try to identify the things, the areas that you can be of service to the artist and to the end goal of making sure that the record gets made, you know, under the circumstances, whether that be budget, um, the workflow, um, knowing musicians that will inspire and elevate you know the, the the solo artist you're working with or you know knowing um, a, a great Vietnamese restaurant in Van Nuys so that a band doesn't get burnt out working under fluorescent lights all day on a song you know like just these things that are oftentimes not directly associated with the sound of a record um, or like what kind of microphones are used on what those things are, are just as important to the record making process and they're the things that like you, as a producer, can allow an artist to not have to think about and in turn just focus on being an artist. And that's, I think maybe that's the best description I can come up with right now for what a producer is. <laughs>